I went with that. Like that was a survival mechanism that mm. I leveraged into a 20 year career. Cause then I could just, you know, be the lovable, sarcastic, smart ass who made like, you know, you know, said really shitty things about Justin Bieber or, or whoever on, on the radio and people laughed and it was great and it was mm. good for ratings. Mm. And I leveraged that the whole way. And, you know, there was sort of this belief that I have to be big in order to be seen or heard or experienced in the world. And that was another pattern that was really difficult to give up. Soul Feed is a space for you to remember the power within you so you can heal and understand the essential role you play in the healing and awakening of everyone around you. Each week, you'll receive an interview, inspired truth talk, or a meditation practice to build your capacity to learn from your past experiences, ground into this moment now, and grow into who you're becoming. One of the bravest journeys is the journey inward. So let's dig deep, love big, and wake up together. I'm Shannon Algio. Welcome home to Soul Feed. All right, welcome to this episode of Soul Feed. Today I am speaking to Dan Mason. Dan is a nationally recognized career and life reinvention coach who helps unfulfilled high performers trade in the corporate world for their life's calling so they can increase their happiness, impact, and income. As he attended a private party at Taylor Swift's Manhattan apartment in 2014, Dan Mason had the realization that he knew what he did for a living, but he had no idea who he was. He left his high paying media executive job and set out to discover his purpose. Using a combination of practical psychology, brain-based success hacks, and spiritual wisdom, he's helped clients across 17 countries navigate their own career and life transitions, including celebrities, gold medal winning athletes, and C-suite execs. Dan's podcast, on which I have been a guest two times now, it's called Life Amplified, debuted number one globally on Apple in 2017, and his work has been featured at Fox TV, BBC, HuffPost, Thrive Global, and the nationally syndicated Elvis Duran Morning Show, just to name a few. I am so, so grateful because I have had the pleasure of being in conversation with Dan many times before. And so I'm so grateful to finally welcome you on Soul Feed Podcast and get to have this conversation and share your work and wisdom. So Dan, welcome to the show. Shannon, it is an honor, my friend. The Soul Feed was so much a part of my career and life reinvention journey when I was trying to find my way in 2015. So it's a full circle moment. It's always an honor to share space with you. And thank you for having me. Mm, it's so, you know, you reminded me of that uh, during one of our interviews on Life Amplified. And it really just touches me when, because, you know, and we're going to really get into this today, is we talk about these things that, you know, being in alignment with our purpose and putting our voices out there and helping others, being of service. And you just don't know sometimes, sometimes there's just like one person who needs to hear what you have to say. And I try and remind myself again and again, like, even if it's just, even if it's just one, and even saying just one feels wrong. If you're helping one person, that has such a ripple effect. So I want to dive in with you. Um, your journey really inspires me and I think is really going to inspire everyone listening because you really came up against a hard no. You, you felt in your career that there was just like, this is not it. Like you said, you knew what you did, but you didn't know who you were. And that can be such a scary moment for people to just admit like, this ain't it. I need to let go. I need to move forward. So could you tell us a little bit about your journey and uh, what it was like realizing that you weren't on the quote unquote right path for you and just how you built up the courage to step away from it and step into the unknown? Yeah, you know, I spent 20 years working in the radio industry and I followed in my father's footsteps. My dad is actually in the National Radio Hall of Fame. Mm. Uh, he had an incredible career and, and I, like many young men, 
idolized my dad uh, growing up. I, I started interning at radio stations when I was 13 years old. All the other kids would be out at the pool playing basketball, chasing girls. I would be getting up at 5.30 in the morning on summer vacation to go into work with him to sort of learn the family business. And it was exciting, you know, being in the entertainment industry and these musicians and famous artists would come through and uh, it was back in the days when radio still like really mattered. I feel like now, like you mentioned radio and people under 35 are like, nope, just Pandora, Spotify. But it, this was back like in the real heyday of radio. And on top of sort of the glitz and glamor of it, I got to connect with my dad that way. That was mm -hmm. a way that we could bond. We could talk about it. And, you know, so I went to college. I had my first on-air job at a radio station when I was 16, like I didn't go to my junior prom because I got to be on the air at some tiny little AM station reading like news and sports scores at three in the morning. I wow. think that, well, the real story on that is I didn't go to my junior prom because I didn't have a date, but it sounds much better to me. Like, <laughs> I was on the radio that night. It's fine. Yep. You can be bothered with prom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I, I turned that into a 20 year career. I ran major radio brands all over the country. Um, you know, I was on the air I, as an air talent. I was hosting these nationally syndicated album release shows with Taylor Swift and with Maroon 5. And everything looked amazing on Facebook and Instagram. Mm. Life was awesome. Like I looked like I had made it. You know, I was making six figures when I was 23. And all those things gave me a real sense of value until it didn't. <laughs> and it was probably around 2009, 2010 that I really started questioning my career path. And I had, like many people who are listening today, that internal sense that I was meant for something more and that I was outgrowing that career. And I didn't want the same things at you know 34, 35 years old that I wanted when I was 25. And it, But it was hard to let go of that because you know, along with my career came the approval of my family. It was the security of a really well-paying paycheck. It was the image of having made it on social media. And I grappled with that for a long time. And when I couldn't find meaning in my career anymore, I thought marriage would be the answer. I got into, you know, it was, it was a toxic marriage. It never should have happened. That lasted all of six months. And the real bottoming out point for me was in 2012. I was 40 pounds overweight. I'm getting divorced, uh, battling depression and anxiety, making a lot of money, living in a half million dollar home in a gated community, but feeling completely spiritually bankrupt and empty. Mm. And I just didn't have the answers. At my lowest point, I was suicidal. Um, and I sat down one night at the kitchen in my house and I set out to write my suicide note. And Literally, the only compelling reason I could find to stay alive at that point in my life is I had this senior dog who had been with me for 10 years, and she kind of walked over and put this big, heavy paw on me and looked at me. And I was like, oh, my God, like, I'm not here. Who, who's going to take care of my dog? Which in some ways, it's like the bond that we have with our pets. But in the other way, I'm like, that's where I was. That was like the only thing I could find to keep me going. And mm -hmm. what I did is I ripped up my note. And I sat down that night and I wrote a letter to the universe. And for the first time, I started getting just honest with myself about what I wanted and what I wanted my life to be like. And I didn't just talk about losing weight. I got specific about the exact weight I wanted to be and the energy that I wanted to have, that I wanted to bring into every interaction with people that I met. And I talked about wanting to have real friendships where I could be open and vulnerable with people and not live on the surface and be this caricature of the outrageous radio guy that I had built for so long. And, and at the time, I thought that the real answer would be if I just got one more big job in a bigger city for more money, that's going to be it. And I made all those things happen in 90 days. I lost all the weight. Got through the divorce, sold my house at, over the asking price at the bottom of the market and created this new life in Boston and, and got to go to a top 10 major market and run a radio station, which was great for about three months. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and then as we talked about earlier, I realized that wasn't it. And I was living, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like the HGTV approach to living your life. I had fixed everything up on the outside of the house. It took the house that was sort of like overrun with mold and had structural damage. I was like, 
we'll put a fresh coat of paint on it and fix up the landscaping. That's, we're going to increase the curb appeal. I looked great. Yeah. You know, I was in shape, but still spiritually seeking and trying to figure out what am I here to do? And, and really, who am I and, and who am I meant to be in this lifetime? Mm. And, uh, you know, that was the beginning of it. Uh, but it was also the first time in my life that I sort of shifted the questions from like a victim -y place of why does this keep happening to me? Why am I so unhappy and unsatisfied? Why am I felt like I was an ungrateful dick <laughs> Like, because mm -hmm. anybody else mm -hmm. would have liked to love to have been going to the parties that I was at and making the money that I was. And it was great for somebody else. It just wasn't a line for me. But I started asking, what's what is it that's trying to come through me? What is this that's trying to emerge? What are these gifts that maybe I've been hiding or suppressing? And 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 what do I really love and what lights me up? And that's the journey that led me to where I am right now with the coaching practice. So uh, mm. long story, even longer. That's sort of the background yeah, well, of how I got here. Yeah. Well, and I just want to highlight like like a few of the things that you just said, Dan, and and just like lift these things up because that moment where you're at your table writing your suicide note was you were you were reckoning with the death of something with a with a mm. wanting a part of you to die and yeah. i and never thought about it that way but that is that is so true yeah that, i mean that's what that's what i heard in that and 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 how how um confusing those moments can be that we we literally think well maybe i need to die like 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 we literally it, it can go that uh, that literal and and feel that uh, painful, and yet you found a way. I I mean, how how powerful for you to shift from writing your suicide note to ripping that up, to changing that to a letter that you wrote to the universe. That literally, that that was a gateway from ending your life to connecting to a spiritual higher power. And I don't know, I'm just kind of moved by how you were, you were ending a part of your life and it felt like a death and you didn't know what to do, but then some part of you was like pushed into a spiritual connection. Let me talk to the universe. Let me talk to this, um, this higher power. And so I, I'm, I'm curious just kind of into that, like how you, um, continue to cultivate that relationship now that you've made this, this transition into the work that you're doing now? Yeah, it was really hard too at the time because my relationship with the idea of God or any sort of higher power, that was not a pleasant relationship. You know, mm -hmm. I grew up, you know, my mom was super into a very fundamentalist, like hellfire brimstone speaking in tongues, Pentecostal church growing up. There was a lot of shame and guilt to unpack there, my idea of God was this version who's just very judging, who's just, I always pictured him as, and I might be dating myself because I know you're a little younger, but I always pictured God as like King Friday from the land of make-believe on Mr. Rogers, that he was just mm -hmm. like the, the puppet with the white beard and the crown, just, you know, sitting there in heaven, like making note of every time, like I masturbated as a kid <laughs> and judging like, me for it. Yeah. So judging it was, and taking notes, judging. And yeah. Taking oh, notes. damn. Well, here's the laundry list of your offenses. So it was really hard for me to even turn over to this idea of a higher power, mm -hmm. but I knew I couldn't figure it out on my own anymore. Like I didn't have the answers and the decisions that I was making, which was essentially to mm -hmm. consume my value externally looking for it in the next job, the next pay raise, the next promotion. Uh, after the divorce, it just became searching for it in the next relationship or the next attractive woman. None of that was working for me. <laughs> and that's and, what we do. That's what we do is we, we um, and when I say we, I think so many of us do this. We yeah. think like, well, let me edit this. Let me get this. Let me add in this. Let me paint over this. Like, you know, like you talk about the HGTV approach, like the makeover. And yet it's like, well, we, we, we kind of get stuck when we realize, well, that didn't work and that didn't work and that didn't work. And every one of those house flipping shows is the same, right? They start like, you know, fixing up like the windows or they fix up the landscaping. And then it's like, oh, wait, 
there's mold inside. <laughs> and, and that was essentially me. Like the house mm. wasn't livable no matter what I was doing on the outside because mm. I really hadn't addressed all the things happening internally. I didn't have any idea what my purpose was. Uh, I didn't really know if I had one. Uh, I, I didn't see value in myself beyond the salary that I made or what I did for a living. And all those things were reflected in the relationships that I was attracting and, and how I was living my life. And, and the thing is, is like to the outside world, nobody had any idea. I mean, maybe some people were on to me, but I really learned in 2012 in that moment about the power of vulnerability. I mean, I had a core group of friends who I went to as I was just trying to unpack the divorce and everything else. And I was like, look, I'm hanging on by a thread right now. And will you guys just be there for me? And that was very hard because I had to admit that I wasn't perfect, air quotes, you know, as we say this, that I wasn't the guy who had it all together and had some wonderful people who came to me during that time. You know, I chased a couple more jobs between 2012 and 2015. After Boston, I went to Tampa and ran three radio stations because I thought that that would be the answer. And then my body started just telling me that there were problems. Like I contracted shingles. I was on blood pressure medication and I was pretty in shape. I was like 38 years old. This should not be my life. And that's a big part of the spiritual journey. That's when I you know, started looking at alternative paths. That's when I first found the Soul Feed podcast and you know, which we knew Alex Kipp, your old co-host was my first life coach. Mm -hmm. But through your podcast is where I learned about people like Gabby Bernstein and Mastin Kipp and people that ended up becoming mentors in, in this transition for me along the way. So everything was divinely connected. It just took me a while to get there. And, you know, the thing that I will say in, in hindsight is the universe is going to win. <laughs> like yeah. You're created with a purpose. Yeah, and I love at that. the end of the day, your purpose has to win out, which means the universe has got to win out. And, and, mm -hmm. and to some degree, you want the universe to win. You can get in the egoic sort of mindset of rationalizing why you should stay put or why there's some other external solution. But you're you're either going to get there through inspiration or you're going to have to learn through a lot of pain uh, or hardship. But you'll get where you need to be eventually. And it yeah. took me a while. I was stubborn. There were a couple of de unnecessary detours and off ramps that I didn't need to take, but that was all part of my learning journey. Mm -hmm. I love that you're naming this because I, um, I haven't talked publicly a lot about this because it really was like an inner journey and an inner shift, but I had that moment, but before I started writing my book and, and before I decided to go to graduate school to study psychology, there was a lot of suffering in, in within me in what I had created my, you know, with soul feed and Instagram. And, and it just reached this point of, is this it? Where do I go from here? Am I just going to interview people for the sake of interviewing people for the, and you know, like, like I came up against this, what next moment and not, not a what next of what do I need to add into my life? You know, what do I need to edit? But what is that next deeper level of purpose that's not Instagrammable, that's not, you know, about perception or, or really about anyone else, but really about me and my truth. And, and that was really intense to build something like Soul Feed that I had so much pride in and, and feel spiritually bankrupt in the space that gave me spiritual purpose. I was, you know, like I felt a lot of shame about that. Like what's wrong with me? And so I'm so grateful to be in the place that I am in now with it, but it required some deep inner inquiry. And so my, my question is for you, having gone through this yourself and based on your experience reckoning with this moment, what do you say to someone who is in that ego death moment? And might even be considering, like, do I want to be on this planet? Where do I go from here? Um, wh where do we start? Like, what are some of the questions we can ask ourselves 
when we know there's something more, but we have no idea what that looks like. Yeah, that's really the midlife crisis, I think, for a lot of people, right? When you realize I've invested all this time in building this life, but this really isn't who I am. And yet I'm not yet this thing that I I can picture for myself that I want to become. So if I'm not the old thing and I'm not the new thing yet, like who the hell am I and where the (laughs) fuck do I go from here? Like that's, that's the dark night of the soul, the midlife crisis, you know, whatever you want to call it. But I I think a a good thing to remember and to sort of put a bow around what you just shared in terms of like, here you are, you built this great, like spiritual brand in the podcast space. And even for you, you're like, okay, there's more out there for me. This isn't it. It, it, Is that your purpose is not the job title. Your purpose isn't a job, whether that's in corporate or whether it's as a spiritual leader, a yoga teacher, a coach, a therapist, it's still not your purpose. Your purpose isn't your relationship. It's not your kids. Your purpose isn't something external to you. It's not this podcast because anything external to you can be taken away Mm. and be fired from a job. I've got the goosebumps. Yeah. You can be fired from a job. Like, you know, I always tell people like, God forbid, cancel universe, cancel universe. We're not putting this out there. I'm going to go walk my dog at the end of this, at the end of this interview today. If God forbid I get run over by a truck or my, you know, my, my windpipe gets crushed and I can never speak again. And I can't coach a client when I'm like, if I lost my purpose, no, I mean, that would suck. I I certainly don't want to manifest that into the universe, but I would find another way. I just, I Mm. would write, I would find some other, other way to communicate and share my gifts with the world. So your purpose is internal and the external vehicles through which you live your purpose will evolve over time. Mm. You know, Oprah Winfrey. I mean, there is a woman who had like the biggest daytime talk show in the history of the world. And she could have done that forever. She wasn't hurting for money. You know, she got her fancy house with all the trees and Super Soul Sunday. But she she had a vision to go beyond it, to go start her network. And so no matter where you're at, there's always going to be a next level. But the ego wants to get attached to a one-dimensional title where we can put ourselves in that box. Mm -hmm. I'm a podcast host. I'm a coach. I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I'm a whatever. So it's really seeing beyond that. And when I even think this was a big thing that kept me stuck for a long time, like when I was thinking about leaving radio, I'm like, what else am I qualified to do? I'm like, I play Taylor Swift songs on the radio for like 15 year old kids. (laughs) It's usually the same song every 15 minutes, by the way. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I was like, I don't know. I'm not qualified to do anything else. And then once I really challenged that story, I realized, well, that's not true. I'm a speaker. I'm a content creator in a variety of forms, audio, written content. Uh, I'm, I'm as a manager at these radio stations. I was a leader. I was a motivator. I was somebody who could uh, help my employees set goals and create plans to achieve them. Uh, as a, a friend and just as a human citizen, I like to think that I was a person who was an empathizer. I cared about the well-being of others. I didn't like to show that a lot. I didn't think people would like that part of me. Mm-hmm. But in my closest relationships, I was able to show that. All those things I just listed, I use in my business every day. I just use them in a way that feels more like me and in a way where I didn't like recreate my dad's life. Mm-hmm. And I And I feel that in this moment, I'm living authentically to my truth and who I am now. Could that evolve in a month? Of course. A year? Sure. Uh, 10 years? Absolutely. But the central purpose, like the emotions that I'm cultivating within myself every day and that I want to share through my service, those haven't changed much. Mm. Yeah, you're, you, you've let yourself evolve and you've let the old shells and the old structures break so that you can come through. And I, I mean, your, your experience of, of moving into your dad's career just so naturally and, and beautifully, you know, it was a connection for the two of you and it, it just launched you into this work. 
is such a reflection of what I think so many of us experience in life. We're like born into these structures. We're taught to fulfill the expectations of others and to be valuable members of society. And then oftentimes what communicates that value is the money that we make and the number of followers we have, these external things. And then and then we hit this point, you could call it a midlife crisis or a quarter life crisis or a dark night of the soul or a spiritual awakening or a rock bottom moment. But it's like, it, it asks us to become individuated. It acts, mm -hmm. you were asked to become you, not your dad. And, and I, I'll be yeah. clear, my dad never leaned on me to follow in his footsteps. That was mm -hmm. never something that was a set expectation. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons, I think that that is a path that I chose, but it was definitely a way we could connect. You know, my dad isn't necessarily somebody who's going to have like vulnerable emotional conversations. You know, that's not who he is. He's from a different generation. But talk about when we could talk about radio, connect it. We could talk mm -hmm. about that forever. You know, go out to dinner and talk about the industry or talk about my career. And, and, and that was a, a source of safety and connection. And yeah, my, you know, my family was really proud of all my success and, you know, it, Daniel's going to this market or, you know, wow, Daniel bought this condo, Daniel's driving a Lexus. Like, you know, there was that attaboy mentality mm. that was never came from a bad place, but it did reinforce for me sort of the belief I had that, well, if I'm not this thing, then people couldn't be proud of me. Certainly each climb up the ladder just sort of reinforced, well, I got to continue to stay on this path because this is how people approve of me. I'm going to get a pat on the back. I'm going to get a gold star. I'm going to be loved. And you talk about that reinforcing um, like with the false authenticity as you consider this new path for your life. You talk about how you did you know you were you were so successful in your job and it, it sounds like it got to this point where you were kind of putting on a show like really good at performing the role that you were expected to oh and, and that i mean that got reinforced for me in middle school like you know i remember we moved to maryland i forgot that you're a montgomery county guy also i forget oh that God. you're oh yeah 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 I was down the road in Poolsville, like uh -huh. out there in the middle of the cornfields. Yeah. Uh, Poolsville's come a little way since then, but mm -hmm. not very far. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I we have had a just, cousin who lives there. We used to go go visit oh, her. No yeah. Kidding. Yeah. Um, there's, I don't know if there's, when I was there, it was pretty much a, the town hall and the McDonald's. That was yeah. about it. Farmlands, above <laughs> yeah. ground pools and McDonald's. Yep. <laughs> So, uh, you know, but we had just moved there. I was in middle school and I had just hit puberty. Like my mom, like talked me into getting a mullet because she thought that that was going to be really attractive. So I had terrible hair, <laughs> rocking the pools, skin. rocking the Poolsville look. <laughs> oh yeah, total. Like the Poolsville stereotype. There's me rolling in with a mullet. Uh, <laughs> I had a bad Southern accent because my early childhood was in Houston. So I had this hardcore Southern accent. We moved to Maryland and I just got bullied every day at the beginning of seventh grade. Mm. Like, you know, and it, because the town was so small, it was seventh through 12th grade all in one building. So it wasn't just getting bullied by kids my age. It was like 17 year old high school seniors who were knocking me into lockers and everything else. Mm. But I went out for the school talent show and I did a stand up routine. And, and all around the same time, while I'm getting bullied, my mom's mental health was really not in a great place. And that was starting to deteriorate. So there were a lot of challenges of just coming home and wondering what was I going to get when I came in the door every day. But I did a stand up routine. And half the routine was about my mom and like how she was crazy, by the way. <laughs> like it was in hindsight, like it, I think it was like 1989. That was a cry for help. Like it, today they'd send mm. CPS into the house. But I was up there making jokes about it and I won the talent show. And mm. then like all the kids who bullied me the next day, they were like, oh, what was that joke that you said again? What was that thing? And I was just like the monkey with the symbols. I'm like, yeah, like this is a great ass kicking preventative. 
Mm -hmm. And I went with that. Like that was a survival mechanism that Mm. I leveraged into a 20 year career because then I could just, you know, be the lovable, sarcastic smart ass who made like, you know, you know, said really shitty things about Justin Bieber or or whoever on on the radio and people laughed and it was great and it was Mm. good for ratings. Mm. And I leveraged that the whole way. And, you know, there was sort of this belief that I have to be big in order to be seen or heard or experienced in the world. And that was another pattern that was really difficult to give up. And it's not like my sense of humor is still part of who I am. I love my sense of humor, but I was just using it. Like that was the only piece of me that I knew how to show to the world. So it letting like go of that. Using it unconsciously to yeah. protect yourself. And it's also this beautiful like gift that you have and something you love about yourself. And there was also a part of me, though, that was also a spiritual seeker. Like, mm-hmm. I, I remember when I got found out by one of my employees, I had somebody who worked for me who house sat for me. This is when I was still in corporate. And she was watching my dog and I was on vacation for a week. I came back. She's like, oh, I'm on to you. I was like, oh, my God. Like, did I leave porn on a computer or something? Like, what <laughs> did I do? Like, what, what could she have possibly found? She's like, your entire DVR is episodes of Super Soul Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> She's like you try so hard soul, to act soul like porn. You. <laughs> the soul porn. She's, she's like you try so hard to act like you, and that was my joke to people in social circles. Oh, you know me, I'm dead inside. wasn't really the case, mm. but that's how I knew to get attention and love because those sensitive, empathetic parts of me weren't rewarded much growing up. Mm. So to, to be in a position now where I built a business and a career on that that took some time and, and that took, that was a process to sort of come out of the spiritual closet. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things you talk about is like how, how every pay raise promotion, social media, like also reinforced people couldn't possibly love the real me. And so, so, you know, I, I feel the disparity between the you that you were being but the you that you were starting to know yourself to be, the part of you that was watching those super soul episodes, the part of you that that did empathize and, and have those softer emotions and enjoy this deeper level of connection. So how did you begin to bridge the gap? Because now you're you're a coach and you've, you know, you've worked with so many different kinds of people and you've, you know, mentored with Mastin Kip and you've learned so much now to help others do this work. How did you start to turn the volume up on that? Um, I, I want to say like softer, more empathetic, like, you know, self-help yeah. loving aspect of yourself and make that the real you that people could see and accept. You know, when I um, when I, I mentioned earlier, your old co-host, Alex Kipp, was my first ever coach. And as I started to do some of that deeper work and the purpose work, and I started to get clear on who I really was, I was so moved by that work. And with no intention of ever turning this into a business, uh, I just wanted to share it with other people. Mm. I went on meetup.com and I created a group and I started facilitating free meetups for other people. And it was, uh, it it was, I don't remember what I called the group, but it was for professionals who were creatively suppressed. Mm. And all these interesting folks started showing up from all walks of life. It would be like the 50 year old sales guy who had made acrylic artwork in his garage, but never took it to market because he didn't believe he was a professional artist. And I had like the grandmother show up who had created like an original Christmas story that she would tell her children every year, but had this dream to self publish it and turn it into a children's book. And as I would start like sharing all these tools and things that I learned with them, all of a sudden these people started going out and like having these amazing breakthroughs. All of a sudden that, that guy, the artist got his art on display at a local installation in Florida. And the grandmother found an illustrator and she self-published her book. And and people started asking me if they could pay me to coach them privately. And I didn't get it. And I tried And I spent six months trying to think of anything to call myself other than life coach, because that felt like too pretentious at that point. I was like, oh, who am I? Like, who am I to teach people about their life? But that was the seeds of it. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of being able to help others rather than 
chasing something else for me. <laughs> it was so addicting mm. and it felt so good that mm. over time I began to show more of this, which was really uncomfortable for the people in my life. I mean, I was in a relationship for a couple of years in Florida with a, a woman who was wonderful, but she, you know, we sort of like connected is two people that were burned out and hated our jobs. It'd be like, oh, you hate your job? I hate my job. Let's go drink a hundred dollar bottle of wine and talk about how we, and then all of a sudden I'm doing this other stuff and people didn't get it. Uh, and so it was sort of like the process. It's not like I turned the volume straight up, as you said, sort of like I turned that volume up to seven and then I was worried it was too loud for the people around me. So then it was back down to about a three and then I work up a little more courage and I turn up to a six and, you know, sort of brace myself for people going to yell, turn it down to a five. So that was a process that unfolded over a lot of time. That was many years. And it probably wasn't until I actually launched my podcast in 2017 that I felt like I had just fully put myself out there. I mean, I just sort of laid my story out on the line. Like here it is. <laughs> yeah. Because even when I was writing articles for like the Huffington Post, I would like bury those on my little Facebook business page that had like 17 followers at the time. I was so scared to put those things on my personal Facebook page because I thought people are going to be like, who the hell are you? We knew you when you were like the guy drunk, passed out in VIP at the Grammy Awards party when you were 26. <laughs> what, you're a life coach? Fuck you. Uh, so I was like hiding everything. Yeah. yeah. And I love that you name that. I'm sorry to interrupt. I love yeah. that you name that because I think that's such a relevant thing for so many of us as we like, and it's, and I kind of identify it as an empathic quality. It's like our empathic quality. We like sense and feel the perception and, and we create the narratives of how people are going to process you know, if I really put myself out there like this, then, you know, all these people know who I was. And so there's like this disparity of like that perception. And it was all a projection of my own like shame that I hadn't dealt with, you know, for all the ways that I was just, you know, chasing the, the wonder of me <laughs> for mm -hmm. so many years mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. made a lot of bad decisions and wasn't always an in integrity with how I showed up. And, and, uh, but all those things that the judgments I carried against myself was easy to project onto other people. <laughs> right. Right. Cause they've seen me maybe at this party drunk or they've, they, yeah. they know who I quote unquote really am. So it's like, as we strengthen who we're becoming, it's like those perceived perceptions of, of the people who knew who we were can sometimes be these internalized voices that say, why bother? Don't turn yeah. the volume up. Keep that volume down. You know, it's, it's part of why I struggle internally with the idea of cancel culture. Like, I'm like, yeah, hold people accountable, but w let's leave a door open that somebody can evolve and change over time. Like if people wanted to judge me for who I was at 23 years old, and make judgments on who I am today. Oh, God help me. You know, it's, but, uh, but, uh, you know, I guess that that's probably a different discussion for another day, but very relevant, you know, uh, though. very relevant. Like yeah. we get to um, grow and learn and can there be accountability without dehumanizing people? Sure. Is a question that I like, like we get to grow, right? Like we get to evolve and, and if there has been meaningful growth, that should be recognized as a part of our humanity, um, it, you know, as we also hold each other accountable to actions that may have been harmful. You know, it's like both can happen. Yeah, I was watching like, you know, just even like uh, the Britney Spears documentary and Justin Timberlake's issuing this apology. And I'm sitting there thinking he was 19 talking to a friend about having sex with his girlfriend. I was like, I, I granted that that went public and that's unfortunate, but are we really trying to cancel Justin because of like some stupid thing he did when he was 19? And, but that was all, you know, again, like I said, I think a lot of that was a projection of some of the places I hadn't fully accepted myself. And, you know, a lot of that turning up the volume was doing my internal work. Uh, you know, to heal those wounded parts of myself and, mm -hmm. and, and to give myself some grace 
uh, so that I can be here on a podcast like this, that I can talk about my life, that I can go on my podcast or speaking engagements or do TV and, and be able to share these things. Give yourself some grace. Like, I just want everyone to hear that together right now. Like, give yourself some grace because without that, you know, if we hold ourselves to the, the these um, perfectionist standards, then we're constantly going to be beating ourselves up for falling from grace. Yeah. And we're human and mistakes are going to happen and none of us are perfect. And we have to give ourselves that grace because otherwise we hold ourselves back from becoming um, yeah. who we're meant to become. And I want to ask you this question because you... um you talk about how you can't out success your trauma. Yeah. And you've named some of like the traumatic experiences that you've, um, that you've had to overcome within yourself. And I just was curious if you want to say more about, about that, like these moments where you've had to really look at some trauma within yourself and, um, yeah, that, that you can't out success your trauma just makes me think about how, uh, out successing can be such a numbing tool. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, that's another addiction. It's, it's not unlike anybody else who's addicted to drugs or alcohol or shopping or sex or gambling. It's, you know, whatever is distracting me from, you know, the pain that's coming up. And there was a lot of that for me um, that I'd partially dealt with and hadn't, uh, you know, certainly in my childhood, there was a history of abuse, physical, emotional, sexual abuse, um, and a lot of things that I had shoved down and then I never really dealt with. Uh, there was just a lot of attachment trauma with, you know, my own parents and some of the developmental trauma. And, and for me, the one way that I knew, you know, that I knew to cope was just be the overachiever. You know, I always talk about um, where do our beliefs even come from? Like, where do we believe that we're not enough? And it's not always like, I guess the other thing I'd share is it's not always, even though I went through some really traumatic things, it's not always those where the beliefs get wired in that I need to accomplish to be more. You know, I've told the story before on my podcast of being in sixth grade. So this is right before we moved to Maryland. And my mom was putting out all these trophies on the mantle, like for all my superlatives that I got that school year. So Daniel is student of the year and Daniel's most athletic and Daniel and his girlfriend were voted class couple. And she would show these and brag about it and like show them off to her girlfriends. But the, the, the challenge was in this, I didn't accomplish any of those things. My mom went to a trophy store and had those created wow. and put them up on the mantle because she was trying to sort of like keep up with her girlfriends. And, and my mom, you know, God love her. She, my mom did, you know, she tried the best she could, but she had her own insecurities and she wanted to be, you know, really good at something. And she wanted to be the best mother she knew how, and that's how she knew how to compete. Mm. And it, there was no trauma. It's not like she ever told me you're garbage because you didn't like, in some way, I think I probably convinced myself I did do those things when I was six years old or when I was in sixth grade. But the meaning that I gave it as I watched her like showing off these trophies is whoever I am right now is not enough to be loved or to be proud of. So I need to be the guy who's accomplishing all that. Wow, and then yeah. mom can brag about me. Mm. And the, the crazy shit is about this is like literally, Shannon, I... I didn't even remember that incident until I was probably 37, 38 years old. I mean, it's a two minute moment in a lifetime that didn't stand out as being a defining moment. But it's also like the summer after that immediately is when I started going to work with dad every day. And I was like, hey, if I'm more like my dad, you know, that'll be the answer. And that's where all those patterns came in of, you know, kind of being the you know, kind of being the guy who could build this significance that way, which became really confusing because as my parents' marriage deteriorated and I'm like trying to replicate my dad's life, then my mom would get angry and fly off the handle and be like, you're just like your father. I'm like, well, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> that's what I'm going for. Um, I thought that, that's what I was supposed to do. Like, <laughs> that's how I get love. What do you mean mm -hmm. now? That's a problem. Mm -hmm. So it was very confusing. But that was, you know, it's also like for every, nobody's born with any beliefs, whatever 
limitations you think you have, wherever the places you don't think that you're enough or you're unlovable, you didn't come out of the womb with that. There's usually a minute in time where we make that neural connection and doing some of that trauma work. Like I said, and that's a very, in the grand scale of trauma, that is a very little T trauma, but it's all about the meaning that I assigned to it at that point. And I sort of oh, took well, all my yeah. mom's unworthiness issues that she had battled with for so long. And I just like ran with it mm. for years. I, you know, took that is like the relay race where I took the baton and I took off with it for 25 years until I collapsed and it just wasn't sustainable. I was just tired of chasing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, I, I love the love, love that you're highlighting this and because it's a reminder that these moments matter. And even though they're fleeting and we can forget them, like, I mean, I saw the image of the mantle and the trophies and just how that would feel to be like earning these trophies that you didn't earn and that messaging of like, you are not enough. So you, so we need to like- And because the reality couldn't have been further from the truth. I was like Mm -hmm. such a wallflower at that age and so shy. And I was never the athletic kid. I was like the theater artsy kid. I was the kid that did stand up. And, you know, I was an okay student, but I wasn't ever going to be valedictorian in my class. So that was the disparity, right? I'm getting bragged about for all these things. But my daily life, you know, day to day was so far removed from that. I'm curious, um, can you tell us, because it's it's so tempting even with our spiritual growth, even with our practice of coming back to ourselves and being true to ourselves, it's always tempting to somehow identify with the out there success. You know, that's something I feel like we constantly come up against. So I'm just curious if you could share with us like your simple practice or practices, a way that you come home to yourself and connect back to, to the insides, that inner value within yourself. Sure. And, and by the way, like if I told, if I were sitting here on this podcast today and being like, well, Shannon, I have perfectly healed this shit. I'd be lying. There are times (laughs) where I get super triggered and, you know, I feel like even within my business, I'm not doing enough because so-and-so coach just got a national TV opportunity or this person, you know, oh God, Shannon algio has got a book. He wrote a whole book. Like, what a, what the hell am I doing? Like, there are times that he talked for- about it on the Life Amplified <laughs> podcast. He's <laughs> in. <laughs> so yeah, there's all sorts of ways that I still get triggered. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I do is I keep. Uh, I just call it. It's at the front of my journal, and I keep it. I keep my own personal list of awesome, and it's all the things that I love and admire about myself. And I really try to focus on not making them accomplishment based, like external accomplishment. It's more about like those internal things that I love about me, my -hmm. sense of humor, my compassion, um, any like good, any text or a nice message that anybody's ever sent me about just how I show up in, in friendships or in my relationships. I'll document those things, you know, I, I, I write them down and I go back to that during those days where, you know, I'm beating myself up that I didn't grow the business by enough during a pandemic or, you know, hey, I did a launch and it wasn't the number that I wanted to hit. I, I go back to those things mm. and remind myself of just some of those badass things about me um, that I'm really proud of and that I admire. And I think that that's that's a great place to start. Also, when it's easy to chase externally, when we're in a place of comparison, Mm -hmm. that when we're comparing ourselves to other people. So I really try to go back and just compare intelligently. And I hate it. Like you go on Instagram or clubhouse and like every person now on clubhouse, like thinks they're dropping like a truth bomb. They're like, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. I'm like, oh, well, that (laughs) never heard that one before. (laughs) I don't even know if that's true. Comparison is neutral. Comparison is neither good nor bad. But I really try to focus on comparing intelligently, which is to compare where I am now versus where I was a year ago, five years ago. Certainly where I was in 2012 when I was ready to check out. 
Mm. And like, that's a, a huge way that I can reset and honor myself is like, holy shit. Like I sat down and it just like totaled up. Like what are the number of countries that I've, people I've worked with and how many lives have I affected and how many people have like listened to the podcast? Not necessarily from a place of I've got to get these numbers up, but from a place of service. Like there's a ripple effect that's immeasurable. I don't know how many people are going to listen to this podcast, but I hope somebody sends it to a friend and it ripples out into the world and it changes somebody's life. So those are the things that I go back to a lot, you know, comparing versus myself where I was and uh, just keeping a running list of, of that. I just call it the list of awesome. <laughs> the list of awesome. I love those, those are two really powerful um tools and practices for all of us like yes 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 to that that and i love i love that you name things about yourself qualities about yourself or like experiences that that, that inner value that you cultivate placing value on it by naming it right it's like you're enhancing the value of it you're directing your attention to those things which means that they matter even more than if you were to like brush them to the side and say whatever you know that's so so powerful and gosh like i think i totally know what it's like to be like you know what if the podcast was getting more downloads or like you know Recently, I had a phone call with someone who um, was potentially going to help um, with some sponsorship on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And the podcast didn't quite reach the number that was required to work with this person. And I instantly, I'm sharing this because I think it's like, it's so what you've been naming. Yeah. I instantly felt so disgusted in my body, angry. And the reason I felt that way as I like kind of sat with it and felt it was I felt like he was telling me that the podcast wasn't valuable enough. It wasn't worth yeah. enough. Yeah. And I wanted to be like, fuck you, you know, yeah. like really it, it, because it was like his perception was determining the value. And so my anger and my rage around that was like, no, 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 no. This is valuable. And I mean, you know, a significant number of people listen to the podcast. So first of all, how dare you? And yeah. second of all, how dare I take yeah, that perception that, oh, I love that. and stop recording, stop publishing, stop doing this because the one person, the one person that's that, like, that's big. You know, even if there's just one person who's like, Ooh, what they are talking about right now is medicine to my soul then fuck it. That's enough. Well, I'm, look, I'm living proof. Like if there was no Soul Feed podcast, you know, I can't say that I wouldn't have taken a different journey to get to where I'm at. But, you know, your work that you were doing with Alex back in the day is directly tied to everything that I've built in my life right now. Um, and, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, you know, by the way, but but yeah, I think that, and I, there is a part of me and I've come to love this part about myself is that I'm also competitive. Mm. There's always mm. a part of me that kind of wants to like in a mentorship group or as a student with, you know, any mentor I've worked with, I want to be the star student. Yeah. And there's that part of me that is who I am. And I try not to judge it. You know, I, I, I've tried to love and accept those parts of myself. I'm in a program right now uh, that's more about media and PR. And just learning how to, you know, leverage and get my message out to more people. And some of the people in this group are getting like features in Newsweek and in Forbes. And there's a little part of me that when I see that, I'm like, good for them. And then that small part of me that's like, well, Dan, your, your story isn't as valuable because these people are getting these. Do the same thing. And yet at the same time this morning, I was on the phone with a producer of a daytime talk show at a major, you know, major network who's interested in, and we're talking about maybe doing something here in the next week. So it's, you know, realizing that other people, also realizing other people's success when I see that and I get triggered by it, doesn't minimize my own and it doesn't take away from my opportunity to create, to create my own success in ways that are aligned through portals or avenues that are, are, are going to allow me to reach the people that I'm meant to reach. 
maybe my people aren't on Forbes. I don't know. I mean, I would love to, if anybody from Forbes is listening, I got you. But like, if that's not, if that's not my por- portal, that's great. If there's a TV show or a interview that's more aligned, if it's this podcast today, awesome. Just yeah. you know, allow me to be a vessel and, you know, just surrendering that guide me to the right opportunity where I can make the most impact And to some degree, so I keep my ego out of it, you know, I think it was a Carolyn Mace who said this, I don't remember it, but also let that impact be invisible to me Mm. so that I don't get Mm. caught up in my own bullshit. Mm. I don't know who, Mm. where that came from, but that's always in the back of my head. Yeah. Well, first of all, while you were just talking, I had a big aha moment. And so I want to say it, don't let other people's measuring stick be your metric for your worth and the worth of your work. Don't let someone else's measuring stick that, oh, like, no. And then, yes, Carolyn Mace, um, you just reminded me of something she shared about that she, like, she would fantasize about riding on, like, a subway train and seeing someone read her book, you know, her novel, and have no idea who she was. And that they'd be, you know, taking in the work, but have no idea who she was. Like, she would just kind of obsess about that that idea. (laughs) I, lo- I would love to meet Carolyn one day. I, I, that's amazing. You got to interview her. She's she's an amazing one. Um, Dan, thank you so much for sharing your your journey, your path, your story, your wisdom. Um, there's so much in your story that I think so many of us can relate to. Moments of struggle and reckoning and confusion cloudiness and clarity empowerment and and so just thank you for for sharing your story is valuable to me this has inspired me today um can you let us know like where we can find you how we can follow you what you've got going on right now that we should know about um how can we stay in touch with you Sure. Uh, You can go to my website, which is creativesoulcoaching.net. I've got one-on-one coaching and also a monthly subscription, uh, a group program with some amazing people from all over the world. That's an awesome community Mm. and a uh, great way to get started with me. You can also follow me on the socials. Most active on Instagram and Facebook. You can find me on Instagram at CSC, Dan Mason. Find me at Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash C soul coaching, uh, because somebody else already stole the Dan Mason name. They beat me to it back in the day, but, uh, and the podcast life amplified. You can listen to that on any podcast platform. Yes. And CSC is creative soul coaching. I really love, I love that, um, name and definitely go listen to, both of my episodes with you on Life Amplified were such great conversations. And there's a recent one about Trust Your Truth. That I'm so grateful that we got to do that together. Yeah, that was um, an awesome episode. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. Always an honor to talk to you. I'm so grateful to know you and thank you for your work. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate how you show up in the world. And like I said, you know, this podcast has been such a part of my life and my journey. So. Thank you for all you do. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Mm, What an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of Soul Feed with Dan Mason. Dan is amazing and how cool that he was a soul warrior. I mean, he is a soul warrior and he was listening to Soul Feed back in 2015 and that was a part of his journey to the path that he is on now. Just makes me feel so many feelings. So cool. And I'm so grateful for Dan. And definitely go check out his podcast, Life Amplified. Listen to the episode about Trust Your Truth that we do together on his show. It's really great. And yes, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who has purchased Trust Your Truth, my book, and also announced that the audiobook is officially available. So if you want to listen to me read the book to you, someone said recently that listening to the book is like listening to a meditation, which brings joy to my heart to get that feedback. It was so fun to record this audiobook. It was three days in studio in Burbank, California. And 
it was just a joy. Speaking each word from the book felt like an initiation, energizing this intention, this vibration, this prayer that is the book into spoken word. So if you uh, like to listen to audiobooks, definitely grab a copy of Trust Your Truth. And if you want to go to the next level beyond and support Trust Your Truth, go to Amazon or Goodreads, Amazon or Goodreads, and leave a review for the book. That would mean the world to me. An honest review makes a huge difference when a book first comes out into the world and helps the book reach more people. So thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to this episode, and I look forward to connecting with you in the next one. See you soon.